in Fresno. Welcome to the Morning Mix. This is the Project Censored Show on Pacifica Radio. It is Friday, June 7th, 2013. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today we analyze the state of the free press and civil liberties in the United States. We'll kick things off with Sue Wilson, founder of Media Action Center, about the private censorship of public airwaves and the FCC's possible ruling, deciding whether or not right-wing radio is bona fide news. Then legendary free press proponent and documentary filmmaker John Pilger joins us from London for a commentary on the state of the free press. And we close out the show with Bo Hodai, author of a new study published by the Center for Media and Democracy, Dissent or Terror? How the Nation's Counterterrorism Apparatus in Partnership with Corporate America Turned on Occupy Wall Street. But first, KPFA News Headlines. Please stay with us. I'm Eileen Alfandari with news headlines. The nation's top intelligence official is revealing more details about one of the two far-reaching secret surveillance programs that have been revealed in recent days. James Clapper is defending the programs involving the collection of phone records of nearly 100 million U.S. residents and the tracking of worldwide Internet use that Clapper claimed was limited to overseas users. Guardian columnist Glenn Greenwald broke the story he appeared on Democracy Now! this morning. The objective of the NSA and the U.S. government is nothing less than destroying all remnants of privacy. They want to make sure that every single time human beings interact with one another, Things that we say to one another, things we do with one another, places we go, the behavior in which we engage, that they know about it, that they can watch it and they can store it and they can access it at any time. And that's what this program is about. And they're very explicit about the fact that since most communications are now coming through these Internet companies, it is vital in their eyes for them to have full and unfettered access to it. And they do. The Washington Post said it reviewed a confidential roster of companies and services participating in the so-called PRISM program. The companies included Apple, AOL, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, Skype, YouTube, and PalTalk. A bombshell announcement this morning in Southern California. Utility officials announced they're closing the troubled San Onofre nuclear reactor permanently after an epic 16-month battle over whether the twin reactors could be safely returned to service. Operator Southern California Edison said in a statement it will retire the twin reactors because of uncertainty about their future. The reactors between Los Angeles and San Diego have not produced electricity since January of last year. That's when a small radiation leak led to the discovery of damage to hundreds of tubes that carry radioactive water in nearly new steam generators. The utility had petitioned to restart one of the reactors, but nuclear regulators had balked, and California Senator Barbara Boxer last month said a recently revealed letter could show criminal misconduct within the company. Anti-nuclear groups had called for San Onofre's permanent closure. Its permanent closure now will leave the Diablo Canyon reactor as the only operating nuclear power plant in California. U.S. employers added 175,000 jobs in May, a figure that shows steady hiring but is below the pace of the fall and winter. The Labor Department said the official unemployment raise rose a tenth of a percentage point to 7.6 percent. The increase occurred because more people entered the labor market looking for work. Heidi Shearholt is an economist at the Economic Policy Institute. She called the current jobs picture an ongoing slog. We are getting enough jobs every month not to deteriorate further, but we're not digging out of the hole that we're in. I guess just to keep this 175,000 jobs added in context, we need 300,000 jobs a month to get back to the pre-recession unemployment rate in three years. The number of people who've been unemployed for more than six months remained unchanged at nearly four and a half million. Workers' rights activists and groups representing consumers and shareholders gathered at the Mountain View headquarters of Google. They called on the Silicon Valley tech giant to take more progressive policies on workers and political action. Christopher Martinez filed this report from Google headquarters. Google's annual shareholder meeting in Mountain View drew shareholders from around the world. It also drew activists who want the company to change its policies on workers' rights and political spending transparency. 
One group of protesters is calling on Google to fight income inequality by using contractors who respect workers' rights. In particular, the rights of security officers from SIS, the company Google uses for security. The activists say SIS provides its workers too few hours of work to get by and not enough hours to qualify for benefits or sick days. Over the last two years, SIS have do a ton of anti-union behaviors. The Service Workers International Union, United Service Workers West, has been organizing at SIS for the last two years. Samuel Kehinde is organizing coordinator for the union. By sending uh, their, one of their managers to come to the union meeting, uh, spying the meeting, they have caught many people that support the union. They have caught their hours. Other activists were inside the meeting. Among them, Jake Parent with the group Public Citizen. He says Public Citizen, along with a coalition of other groups, is asking Google to disclose their political spending and leave the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The don't be evil uh, slogan gets thrown around a lot, but Google has also says explicitly uh, time and time again that transparency is a core value of the company. You know, they have built a brand that's based off of providing a free flow of information for people across the world. So for them to not disclose their own political spending uh, seems to really fly in the face of, uh, of everything that they stand for. Reporting from Google headquarters in Mountain View, I'm Christopher Martinez. Walmart company shareholders are meeting today in Arkansas for their annual meeting. Walmart executives will talk about their business strategy. Last year, Walmart increased sales 5% to more than $450 billion worldwide. Protesters have been rallying outside. They're calling for better wages and benefits for Walmart workers and an end to retaliation against those who advocate for better conditions. Activists also want Walmart to sign a legally binding fire and building safety agreement. It would protect low-wage workers like those in Bangladesh who sew garments sold in Walmart stores. The Senate has opened debate on far-reaching legislation to overhaul the nation's immigration system. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid began what will be weeks of deliberations on the Senate floor by declaring the immigration system broken and praising the bipartisan legislation. Republican Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama countered the bill will not succeed in ending illegal immigration. With a forecast for the San Francisco Bay Area, patchy morning fog and clouds becoming sunny. Highs in the lower 70s to mid 80s around the Bay, the 90s in the warmest interior valleys. In Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley, sunny and hot. Highs 100 to 105 degrees. You can hear expanded versions of our local news reports at PacificaEveningNews.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari. I'll be back with headlines at noon. Be sure to join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. Welcome back to the Project Censored show in the morning mix. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. Today's program, we focus on free press and civil liberties concerns. We'll kick things off here with Sue Wilson of the Media Action Center. Later on this morning, we'll hear from John Pilger. And we'll finish the program with Bo Hodai talking about a new study, Dissent or Terror, published by the Center for Media Democracy. So here's Peter to kick things off this morning and introduce Sue Wilson. Peter. Well, welcome. Uh, Sue Wilson is a media activist. She's director of the Public Interest Pictures Broadcast Blues and a 22-year veteran of broadcast journalism. She's known numerous awards, including an Emmy. She's worked at CBS, PBS, Fox, and NPR, and she's editor of the media criticism blog, Sue Wilson Reports, and founder of the Media Action Center. Sue, are you with us? I am. Hello, Peter. Good to talk to you. Um You've been active up in Wisconsin monitoring um, some of their big radio stations up there and their coverage of the uh, attempted leak recall the governor up there and found that uh, some of these stations were very biased. Tell us uh, what you found. Yeah, it's not just that they were biased. What we find in, in the Milwaukee general area, and, you know, when we talk Milwaukee, we're talking the radio stations that also promote Paul Ryan. What we found in that area is that there are five local talk radio shows that are on the air 15 hours a day, Monday through Friday. As might be expected, those local talk radio shows are, quote, conservative, 
And that's fine. They have a right to get on the air and talk about their ideology. However, they crossed a line, Peter. What they've been doing, and when I say they, WISN, a clear channel station, and WTMJ, a journal communication station, 50,000 watts each, these two giant stations throughout the Scott Walker recall actually used the airwaves to specifically promote Scott Walker, to tell people to vote for Scott Walker, to tell people, here's where you can go to volunteer for Scott Walker. Now, what we did was we, we actually got people with stopwatches recording these shows and monitoring exactly how many minutes per day this went on. What we discovered is that between the two stations, it was 160 minutes every single day of direct promotion of Scott Walker to be elected as governor. At the same time, though, there were Democrats, supporters of the opponent, Tom Barrett, who were writing in, asking for comparable time. And the station specifically said, no, you can't be on the air. The only people we're putting on the air are people who are for Scott Walker. Uh, Sue Wilson, uh, this is Mickey Huff. Thanks for joining us this morning. This, Hiya, Mickey. This gets, uh, yeah, this gets even more interesting here. Uh, some of our listeners may remember the something called the Fairness Doctrine that, that ended supposedly under the, the Reagan years there. That's 1987. Uh, but, but you uh, write in your recent pieces, and these were published too on the, on the Brad blog, uh, Brad Friedman, um, who's, uh, who, whom we've worked with at Project Censored. You, you found something called the Zappel Doctrine. Could you, could you talk to us about this and how um, this is not just a potential violation of the First Amendment, but there's this other FCC rule that many people don't don't know about. That's right. I mean, I think when I told the story, people instantly go, well, that doesn't seem right. It isn't right, and it's not only, uh, it's against the law. Let me, let me get into it this way. Um, there is a law on the books. It is called the Equal Time Rule. If you are a candidate running for office, and a broadcaster puts your opponent on the air, you are also entitled to equal time on that radio station. The FCC's uh, role is to write rules then to enforce the law. So the FCC wrote a rule that expanded the equal time rule to not just candidates, but supporters of candidates. So if there's a surrogate of a candidate on the air talking about his candidate and how great the candidate is, well, surrogates of the other candidate are supposed to be allowed on the air. That is called the quasi-equal opportunities rule, or Zappel Doctrine. So, really, these stations in Wisconsin have clearly violated this FCC rule. The trick is, the FCC hasn't had a challenge on this rule for 30 years. And they're not sure that they really want to enforce it, because, really, the FCC does not want to enforce any of its rules that protect the public interest. Uh, so why, why would you say that's happening? And you filed a, an urgent complaint with FCC, and they have, uh, to my understanding, not responded to that. So why are they dragging their feet? You know, I'm going to use a term I've learned recently called regulatory capture. What that means is that the regulator has been captured by those it is supposed to be regulating. And what I see, and I've been following this since 1998, this is not anything new. Um, what I see is that the FCC really cozies up to the lobbyists for the big media corporations that are knocking on their door every day in Washington, D.C., whereas we, the people out here who are fighting the good fight and saying, wait a minute, we own these public airwaves were entitled to be on the radio during campaigns if you're going to put one candidate on you have to put the other on but they're just not used to the public really standing up and shouting and fighting for us so sue wilson you've been again you've been writing about this for at least a year um, the Scott Walker issue, and you cited uh, th this is also of interest to us because uh, I don't know some folks that that pay attention to uh, you know industry or, or broadcast industry publications like Radio Inc. and and some others. You you actually caught their attention, and um, they they started attacking you. 
um, about these these issues, even though that and you had argued this uh, quite well, that basically was a straw person yeah. argument that they were conducting. Um, could you tell our listeners a little bit about this Supreme Court case, the Red Lion? the FCC, because it states here that the First Amendment does not protect private censorship by broadcasters who are licensed by the government to use a scarce resource, which is denied others. And that's what you're explaining here. Absolutely. I, I, and the Supreme Court of these United States has come down again and again. And the Red Lion case goes back to 1969. But even the Roberts Supreme Court has come down saying that broadcasting is very special because there are scarce frequencies. There's only so many frequencies in our air over which a radio station can broadcast, and those airways are owned by all of us. Therefore, broadcasting does get to be regulated to ensure that all of our rights are upheld. Now, when we look at that Red Lion First Amendment case, it's very clear that, yes, a radio station does have a First Amendment right. A radio host can get on the air and say pretty much what they like. But what they can't do and what they have been doing, they cannot prohibit members of the public from getting on the air and having their say, especially during elections. It is violating the First Amendment rights of all of those people who are denied access to the big microphones. So, Sue, the, these two stations, WINSN and WTMJ in Wisconsin, covering probably the entire state, um, were really promoting Scott Walker um, exclusively in, in, in their talk host shows. And, and you filed an FCC complaint. They responded by saying that these were bona fide news shows. Is that correct? And what do they mean by that? <laughs> well, let's go back to that original law that I was talking about, the equal time law, okay? There is an exception to the equal time law that if a candidate, or rather, is that, that if a station is a bona fide news program, they don't have to give equal time. Now, that's kind of counterintuitive, but if you think of it this way, if, for example, uh, during a presidential election, Mitt Romney comes through the Bay Area for a big event, the news stations want to be able to go out and cover that event without worrying that now they have to give equal time to Barack Obama. When Barack Obama wasn't in the Bay Area, he was over in Texas or somewhere else. It frees up a real news station to be able to cover live time events in their areas. What these, and this is a real Hail Mary pass from these stations, what they're arguing is that Oh, well, we can do what we like on our air with our talk radio hosts, which are, you know, your typical conservative, all one way, Rush Limbaugh style hosts. They're arguing that those shows are bona fide news. And we are really pitching a fight over this one. Well, guys. This, is, this is interesting, Sue Wilson. So, and in your piece, uh, again, this is what, what has been coming up, and this is how Radio Inc. got into this as well. Um, basically, the question then is, is Rush Limbaugh as much of a bona fide news provider as, say, you know, historically Walter Cronkite was? That, that was one of the examples that was used. And we won't use this as a platform to get into Walter Cronkite, per se, uh, or, or corporate media or, you know, any of the networks or what have you. But the point is, is the the the, the, the the term bona fide news is purportedly making a difference, right, between uh, the 90-odd percent of talk radio that's right-wing claiming that it's bona fide news versus any remote pretense of objectivity. Yes, and let's not forget that really part of the goal with these talk radio stations is to confuse the public about what is news and what is opinion. That has been an agenda, according to David Brock, who founded Media Matters, for more than a generation. And, you know, it's working. A few years ago, Pew Research reported that 22% of Americans believe that talk radio is bona fide news. It's critical that we start to draw a line right now saying, no, there is journalism, there is reporting, and then there is opinion based on information, but opinion. What we'd really like to see the FCC do is to come down and say stations need to label what is news and what is opinion. So there's a clear line like you might find in a newspaper's editorial page. All right, so Sue Wilson, um, Obama's FCC uh, head, Tom, Tom Wheeler, uh, might be 
chiming in on this? There is no question that the FCC commissioners will have to decide the underlying Zappel Doctrine case. They're going to have to decide this. The question is, are they going to decide this in the next six months or in the next six years? There is no timetable for them to act. And that is part of why we are putting as much pressure on the FCC as we can to say the people of Wisconsin cannot afford to go through many more elections with this one-sided assault on the Democrats. So, and Sue, you, a- you have a, a petition online, tell the FCC talk radio is not bona fide news. How do people uh, get involved in that? Go to our website, Google Media Action Center or MediaActionCenter.net. Um, you can find it at the very top of the page. You can also find all of the legal uh, documents. We have filed a petition to deny the license of these stations. You'll see their responses. But, yes, that uh, very important petition is at the very top of the Media Action Center website. Sue Wilson, thanks so much again for joining us, and thanks for keeping us apprised of this very important issue uh, about the uh, significance of the free press uh, and, you know, really what's what's going on here. And I think more importantly, Sue Wilson, uh, also trying to, to, to tell the public what, what, what we can do about it, how we can reclaim the airwaves. Well, thank you, Project Centered, for being you. <laughs> thanks a lot, Sue. After this short musical break, we'll be joined by John Pilger. Please stay with us. to the Project Censored show on Pacific Radio. I'm Mickey Huff with Peter Phillips. We are joined now by John Pilger in London. John Pilger, of course, is the award-winning filmmaker and journalist with 60 films. His recent film, his most recent film, uh, The War You Don't See, was actually censored by the Liberal Landon Foundation in the U.S., an irony of epic proportions given the film's subject. Uh, and his new film, Utopia, looks at the Aboriginal population in Australia, um, prison rates, and, and uh, some serious problems uh, that are going on uh, with that population. But of course, also our listeners know John Pilger is a longtime outspoken proponent of free press principles, longtime supporter of the public's right to information. And again, John Pilger joins us this morning to talk about the state of the free press. John Pilger, welcome to the Project Censored Show. Uh, good morning, Mickey and Peter. Hi, John. It's good to hear from you. Um, yeah, you too. Your work, your, uh, tell us briefly about your new movie now. You're working on a, fa- on a film called Utopia, which addresses uh, issues in Australia, uh, particularly how Western Australia is one of the richest uh, states in, in, in the world in terms of um, resources, iron, ore, gold, nickel, oil, petroleum, and all of that has been, you know, billions of dollars of profits, but then the indigenous people, the aborigines who are living there, have have suffered greatly because of this. So you're making a film on this. Tell us about how that's coming. Yeah. Well, it's... uh it's it's uh, where I where I come from originally. So uh, there's a, uh, a particular interest and passion about the subject. I've I made uh, a film called The Secret Country many years ago about Australia. It's a universal story, and you close your eyes. You could be in the United States, Canada. It's about the exploitation of resources at the expense of the indigenous population. Uh, Australia has just been uh, declared by the OECD to be uh, uh, recession-free, one of the happiest countries in the world. Uh, That may be so, but uh, certainly it's not for its indigenous people, which is Australia's dirty 
secret uh, Western Australia, which you mentioned, is the home of the world's biggest mining boom. Uh, Western Australia, which is uh, the size of uh, uh, two or three Texases, has uh, just about every kind of, uh, of, of mineral wealth. Uh, it's also home to uh, uh, those Aboriginal uh, clans and tribes that have survived over uh, several hundred years of effective genocide in Australia. Uh, and uh, so the, 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 the mining is going on uh, at the expense of these people. And how do they deal with the people? Well, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, Inspector of Custodial Services, as he's called in Western Australia, has just declared that state a state of imprisonment that has, has the highest prison rate in the world, nine times higher than apartheid South Africa. And most of those prisoners are black, Aboriginal Australians who represent about 3% of the population. So it's one of those hidden stories that tells us a great deal about uh, the imposition of great power, great multinational power. All these mining companies are multinationals on, uh, on, on, uh, on ordinary people and their ways of life. John Pilger, uh, once again, you're telling the story that that we would we would hope that a truly free press would tell, and they're they're not they're not telling. And um, for a long long time, uh, people have relied on you and, and your work to tell those stories. And this this story is centuries old in the making, really. If you look at Western imperialism, the treatment of indigenous peoples in uh, not, uh, what what became the United States. So this is an on, ongoing tale. It's a story of colonization. Uh, colonization has pretty much the same characteristics wherever it is. Uh, the, there are great likenesses between what happened in the United States and what happened in Australia. A genocide, an onslaught on, on the original people, uh, exploitation and so on. Um, in fact, one of the premises of colonization is to uh, is to eliminate, and that is usually to eliminate uh, the first people of that of that country. It, it, I've always felt that un, unless we understood that, unless we went back to those those beginnings of where our modern societies come from, where the word civilization was coined, you know, which has, of course, it's a, a double-edged meaning, uh, because it means that on the other side, the uh, people are, are not civilized. So where civilization actually came and, and drew on its riches and became prosperous, and uh, until we understand the origins of that, I, I don't think we can really understand what's going on today. John, you you um, talk about how that uh, Western Australia is one of the premier tourist destinations, um, and I know that you've traveled also uh, years before in the Southwest and the United States, which is also a very heavy tourist destination where where the indigenous people here and of course in Australia have been really repressed, and and these stories no longer are simply not out there in any major way. Uh, so that people understand the history and the culture of of the people that that are being dealt with is that is is that essentially correct? Yes, yes, it is because if those stories were 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 known, if the truth about what happened to the first peoples of our colonized countries uh, was known, uh, it would intrude on the mythology uh, of our societies um, the mythology of uh, of uh, uniqueness of uh, of special societies of exceptionalism of uh, uh, of uh, of bringing um, uh, as I say, a particular civilization to part of the world, it would it it, it would undermine that mythology uh, a great deal. So it, it it has to remain, if you like, a kind of open secret. Um, 
And that's very true in Australia, where, uh, unlike the United States, where there is a very considerable awareness now of Native American uh, uh, history and rights and what happened, uh, in Australia there's almost none. There's almost no understanding. There's an indifference and quite a cruel indifference. So it's well behind the, the U.S., it's well behind Canada, it's well behind New Zealand, which has its Maori population. Uh, in fact, it's pretty well at the bottom of uh, the list of uh, countries that have, in, colonized countries that have indigenous populations, which makes it makes its story quite urgent. I think. So the, these these mythologies that you talk about, uh, the dominant culture mythologies that are part of our our corporate media complex. Uh, uh, hey, hey, John, can, our producer is asking you to back off a little bit on your phone. Okay. Um, we're, we're picking up. Yeah, I think that sounds better. Yeah. Okay. Um, we want to switch over and talk about Syria. Um, yeah. How, what's, what are the mythologies about Syria that are so prominent in the corporate media today? And how do you perceive oh. what's going on there? Uh, I, 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 I think, uh, busting myths is, is probably the, 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 the great noble cause, really, uh, because, uh, here we can, we can, we can rush forward to Syria and, uh, the Middle East, which is just, uh, uh overflowing, uh, with myths. Uh, it's all getting very confused for those, for the myth makers in Syria. Uh, these, uh, the people who were, uh, rebelling against the Assad government, uh, are not, many of them are not very pleasant. In fact, they're extremely unpleasant. And what we're seeing happening in Syria is the, the dismemberment of one of the most multi-ethnic societies in the in in the Middle East. It's the product itself of colonialism. Its boundaries were drawn, as most of the states in that part of the world were drawn by uh, uh, by by the British and the French. Uh, but the the uh, uh, the the Assad government, uh, while certainly conforming to the uh, the very horrific image of a dictatorship in some respects, uh, also oversees, as I mentioned, a very multi-ethnic and a very delicately balanced society. Uh, into which this civil war has come. Now, yet again, the so-called great powers, the United States, Britain, France, and the European countries, I suppose, European Union, um, have backed the, uh, the, the so-called rebels. But what this means is that they've exacerbated a civil war and may well have spelt the end of this delicate balance of multi-ethnic uh, groups in that country. Uh, and I think until we understand that, uh, we on the outside are never going to be in a position to pressure our governments either to back off or to take part in what used to be called diplomacy. It's a word we almost never hear about these days. The ultimate irony of Syria is that we've seen the Russians, um, the inheritors of uh, the Soviet Union, who have engaged for their own reasons, in their own interests, of course, but they have engaged in diplomacies. And it doesn't seem to me to be all that impossible for the United States and the Russians to engage and using the facility of the United Nations and all the rest of the reserves of expertise that there still must be in the world to bring about some kind of, if not resolution, but uh, a, a, a slowing down, perhaps bringing us towards a resolution 
revolution in Syria. The alternative is just too horrific, as we're as we're seeing now. It's horrific right now. Well, John, we're talking to John Pilger. You can go to his website, johnpilger.com, to see more. Uh, John, you wrote a piece in March. The new propaganda is liberal. The new slavery is digital. And this this um, this is pertaining to what's going on in places like Libya and Syria. We've really seen a more or less NATO lockstep kind of propaganda about what's going on there, even in some of the alleged progressive press. And uh, you're you're a long time. Um, uh, you know, you've long critiqued propaganda and media as as propaganda. Um, what's your take on what's going on here? And let's segue some of this in terms of what we've learned from some of the WikiLeaks cables and and some of that. Mm. Well, I, you know, my my sense is that we until we understand that the most potent propaganda is that which comes from the most reputable sources, we'll never really understand the power of modern propaganda um too much we we look to uh the uh the the uh, the accredited bad guys the murdochs the fox news um the sort of cartoon propaganda and i don't wish to underestimate its influence it's very great indeed uh, the Murdoch Empire has monopolies all over the world, so it plays a very big part in this propaganda. But uh, my, my observations as a journalist working within the mainstream, certainly in this country, in Britain, is that the the, the most forceful and the most manipulative propaganda ultimately the most powerful propaganda comes from the likes of the bbc the new york times uh and the what i would call the the liberal end or what calls itself i suppose the liberal end of of the media um the because there's so much else on the other side that is just simply not believable. But uh, when the New York Times speaks, it's meant to be believable. When the BBC broadcasts, it's meant to be believable. Uh, and yet in both organizations and in other organizations, media organizations like it, there is... There's a, a, a facade of objectivity behind which there is the propaganda of the state. Uh, all the wars, for example, in the last, uh, I suppose, uh, a dozen years or so, going back to the first Gulf War in 1991, so we're over 21 years, 22 years ago, have been promoted um, vigorously by all these reputable news organizations. Uh, for example, uh, a couple of very credible surveys found that the, the BBC gave uh, less airtime to those um, uh, questioning and opposing the invasion of Iraq than any other uh, broadcasting organization in the West. And now that would surprise a lot of people, especially in the United States, who actually look to the BBC as, as somewhat more credible, perhaps, than some of the U.S. media organizations. So I think that's very important to understand that when we understand that and when we start to deconstruct the kind of propaganda that we don't yet regard as propaganda, then I think we'll, we see the we we we, under, we then begin to understand the sheer pervasiveness, the scale of 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 propaganda in free societies. It's 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 something that um, that you know me, me, many have written about. Noam Chomsky and Robert Chesney and and others of Ed Herman, uh, and it's something that's it's 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 a terribly urgent issue for us because. The old, the old truth of information being power, our power, applies today more than ever. 
John, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear you say that the, the New York Times and the BBC are one of the most effective propaganda machines in, in, in the world, and that um, imperial power have used multi-ethnic divisions um, for control worldwide for hundreds of years. Um, this goes back, I mean, even in recent history, of course, to, to Libya, to Yugoslavia, the various wars that have been defined as humanitarian interventions were, in fact, uh, really stirred up by imperial powers in many ways. So you recently have, have met with Julian Assange, and um, mm-hmm. the WikiLeaks have, have, have been a big expose of the manipulations that um, uh, the imperial powers are, are engaging in, particularly the United States. So what, what, is, what does he have to say about it, and, and how do you feel about uh, what's happening with him? One of the reasons that uh, Julian Assange uh, upset so many people in the likes of the New York Times and the BBC and other organizations and liberal organizations is that he and his own organization, WikiLeaks, have, have, have shamed so many of those who, whose job has been to keep the record straight and who haven't done that job. Um, I think in over the last couple of years, WikiLeaks has told more people around the world um, how their governments have lied in secret, uh, various degrees of importance, uh, than uh, than newspapers, uh, most newspapers have in in my lifetime. Uh, it it, it uh, the I mean, the whole issue of of whistleblowing. Whistleblowers, you know, I, since I've been an investigative journalist, but whistle, a whistleblower as a source has been the absolute lifeblood of my of my job. Uh, most of the time, we don't get really hard facts, really hard information from simple journalism, we get it from whistleblowers who give it to journalists. And that's why this assault on WikiLeaks, the assault on, uh, well, the trial of, so-called trial of Bradley Manning, the assault on whistleblowers by the Obama administration is so important. Here's a, a president who is prosecuting more whistleblowers than all previous presidents combined, not even George Bush, uh, 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 has has uh, uh, approached Obama's record. The, the and uh, because great power now understands it always did, but now it really understands. It's got the technology to understand it even more. That. Whistleblowing and the journalism that supports it uh, represents real freedom. And we talked earlier about mythology, the kind of freedom that comes out of great state apparatuses, such as the U.S. administration, is mythology. The real freedom comes from people who are truth-tellers, uh, who are invariably whistleblowers. John, John Pilger, uh, we're going to have to wrap it up there, and that's a fine note to end on, whistleblowers as truth-tellers, and that's a major theme in our upcoming book, Censored 2014, Fearless Speech in Fateful Times, that we're working on with Andy Lee Roth, and uh, we're, of course, happy to have a piece from, from you coming into the new book. And uh, we thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us today. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. We've been talking with John Pilger. You can learn more at johnpilger.com. His last movie was The War You Don't See. You can learn more at his website. After a brief musical break, we'll be back with Bo Hodai to talk about a recent study on dissent or terror, how the nation's counterterrorism apparatus in partnership with Corporate America, turned on Occupy Wall Street. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Project Censored show on The Morning Mix. I'm Mickey Huff in studio with Peter Phillips. 
For the final segment today, we are joined by Bo Hodai, who is author of Dissent or Terror, How the Nation's Counterterrorism Apparatus in Partnership with Corporate America Turned on Occupy Wall Street. The report was published jointly by the Center for Media and Democracy and DBA Press. Hodai is a regular contributor to the Center for Media and Democracy and publisher of DBA Press. And you can also see more of this study online at prwatch.org. Bo, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Oh, thanks a lot for having me, Ricky. This is an incredible study, uh, 80 odd pages uh, and or more. Um, could you tell us, uh, give a brief introduction here for for listeners? Um, what exactly was this about? Uh, well, basically, uh, we um, we're looking at with this report uh, the um, the width and depth of uh, Fusion Center surveillance of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, nationwide, uh, the primary narrative uh, details the, uh, the monitoring, surveillance, and suppression of uh, Occupy Phoenix, of course, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, however, there are a number of other discussions in the report. Uh, one of the, um, the the primary discussions is on the role that uh, public-private information sharing partnerships or intelligence sharing partnerships played in this uh, and this monitoring, and even uh, possibly the suppression of activist activities. Um, Bo, this is Peter Phillips. Hi. Um, Hi. I was. I read a uh, major part of your report last night. I was quite amazed the, de- the the degree to which Homeland Security, the FBI, working in cooperation with business leaders in various communities all across the country, but particularly Phoenix is what you were talking about. Uh, yeah. There's literally the Chamber of Commerce uh, group um, was advising, um, you know, Homeland Security about how to repress or where, how, what they should do in terms of repressing or even intervening with Occupy. And, and in a sense, this, I mean, this has nothing to do with terrorism anymore. It's really a turning uh, on the American people uh, of, you know, with free speech rights and addressing the government. It's a turning on them, uh, utilizing these these terrorist, anti-terrorist establishment that has now been placed in America to, to do that. So tell us in detail what happened with Jeremy Diamond, what happened in, in, in Phoenix. Uh, well, <clears throat> So with uh, the, the report starts out with a uh, an anecdotal lead discussing uh, Jamie Dimon's trip to Phoenix, Arizona, and it was in uh, October, I believe it was October seventeenth of uh, two thousand and eleven. Um, Jamie Dimon's or, or uh, J.P. Morgan Chase's uh, director of security contacted a detective at the Phoenix Police Department by the name of Jennifer O'Neill. And Jennifer O'Neill, in addition to being a uh, Phoenix Police Department Bureau of Homeland Defense detective, is also uh, the coordinator of the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center Community Liaison Program. And the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center, ACTIC, is, you know, more commonly known as the Arizona Fusion Center. This community liaison program is a uh, a program uh, that... Is, was created to work with private sector allies in the gathering and sharing of intelligence related to terrorist threats, primarily with the uh, object, objective of critical infrastructure, key resources, protection, and typically, you know, critical infrastructure, key resources, people might think of uh, dams or nuclear power plants, things like that. Anyways, so um, uh, Jamie Diamond, uh, Chief of Security, contacts this, this uh Tactic uh, community liaison program coordinator, and says, "Hey, uh, Mr. Diamond's coming to town. He's going to have a uh, a town hall type event for 2,000 of his employees at uh, Diamondback Field in Phoenix." And uh, I guess basically the the idea was they they wanted to see if there was any sort of Occupy Phoenix plans in the work that might discomfort the uh, the president and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. So uh, the uh, email records we have show that uh, Jennifer O'Neill, uh, this this ACTIC CLP coordinator, uh, went on to um, to monitor basically the uh, online activities of members of Occupy Phoenix to see if indeed they had any plans, uh, because of course, like like many Occupy groups, Occupy Phoenix was very active in social media, posting a lot of their plans that 
that we, you know, through Facebook and other things. And she reported back to the J.P. Morgan Chase uh, director of security that it doesn't appear that Occupy Phoenix is even aware that Diamond is coming to town. So, you know, basically it looks like you guys are safe. And, and you know, by safe, I mean they're safe from, you know, any embarrassing protests. Uh, well, Boho Dai, um, you're talking about the FBI Operation Tripwire as well, uh, this right. effort to uh, monitor. I mean, these are very COINTELPRO-like um, kinds of operations. Um, also, uh, more revelations of eavesdropping and government spying on people's records. I mean, this, it, it, again, it's it's almost impossible for people to ignore that this kind of thing is happening, um, even though uh, it, not long ago, if you suggested such things, you would be an outlandish conspiracy theorist. Here's all the evidence, and in Dissent or Terror, the study, we urge people to read this, this study at Center for Media and Democracy, prwatch.org, Lisa Graves and the great crew there. Um, we urge people to go read that. This this is going on, and you factually demonstrate this in your piece. Yeah, and you know it's it's interesting also um, to mention the FBI. You know, on the heels of our our discussion on Jamie Dimon in Arizona, because um, the uh, the FBI actually had gone around, according to uh, records we got from the FBI through a FOIA request, had actually gone to the security personnel of Zion's Bank in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, on the very day that Occupy Salt Lake City was launched, and uh, they were warning the uh, you know this, this director of security for Zion's Bank that uh, actors sympathetic with anonymous, I believe is the wording they used, had uh, quote doxed. Uh, J.P. Uh, J. Or excuse me, uh, Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein, and um, you know it says right right in the report, the FBI report, that doxing means the posting of public information on the internet. And I looked at that and I thought, you know, this must be a typo. I mean, what's the FBI care if uh, you know people are posting public information about bankers on the internet? It sounds perfectly legal. As a matter of fact, as journalists, that's what we do every day. And uh, <laughs> and I, I checked into it, and that's, as a matter of fact, all it was. I mean, it was all publicly available information that somebody had assembled into a um, into a document and posted on Pastebin about, you know, respectively Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein. And, uh, you know, it's just incredible to see that the uh, the FBI was making it their business to warn bankers of legal activity. And then when you look at it in the context of all these other public-private partnerships, uh, public-private intelligence sharing partnerships that we see in the world of, you know, purported counterterrorism, it, it really makes a lot of sense. And it, it's very unfortunate, of course, that it, it makes uh, as much sense as it does. This idea of doxing somebody, all that is is taking public information and making it perhaps more public if you're right. a head of a bank that's got a giant bailout or you're accused of being involved in the in the, in the LIBOR scandal of manipulating the credit card rates and stuff for the, for the public. Um, what's really concerning to me in this report was what's called the Domestic Security Alliance Council. So this is national. And uh, this council is made up of the FBI and Homeland Security. But some 29 corporations including MasterCard, Citigroup, American Express, Barclays, uh, Walmart. Um, this is corporate America interacting at the highest levels with, with Homeland Security and, and the FBI, repressing citizens' rights, essentially, and preempting. This isn't about terrorism at all. This is about domestic control of the American people. And right, and it... No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go, no, go, go right ahead. This is your, it's your report here. Oh, I, well, I was going to say, you know, another thing that sort of speaks to their motives, because like you said, you know, after all we're talking about is the monitoring and suppression of constitutionally amended, or constitutionally protected rights. Uh, and so something that's interesting to note, speaking to, uh, you know, the motivations of some of these uh, corporate actors involved in DSEC, for example, uh, the Domestic Security Alliance Council, is one of the records that we got, one of the very few records that we got from the FBI relating to DSEC, um, 
was a, uh, a report. Actually, the origin of the report was unknown, but it was responsive to a DSAC request. And uh, given the fact that it was a Coast Guard-issued report in FBI records, given the involvement of DHS and DSAC as a partnership with the FBI and the private sector, it appears that it's most likely a DSAC report. But anyways, in this report, they're speaking about possibilities of interruption to supply chains for, you know, basically commercial retailers uh, as being a primary concern um, related to uh, the Occupy protests uh, involving ports in November and December of 2011, the shut down the ports idea. That was, of course, uh, the Oakland port was shut down for 14 hours. There were threats of other other closures around the country, um, right. and this certainly got uh, the FBI up in arms on Homeland Security. Uh, right. I, I believe it was in the context of the Oakland port. They were saying something to the effect of if it spreads to San Diego, I believe, we could be looking at severe supply chain disruptions. Uh, Bo, Bo Hodai, then in a nutshell here, uh, dissent or terror, you're talking about infiltration, surveillance without criminal predicate. You're talking sure. about public-private intelligence sharing partnerships, counterterrorism, homeland security, branding Occupy groups or or anti-NDAA groups and so on as terrorist threats. Um, sure. and, and you're really talking about what, let's just break it down, a fascist culture police state uh, uh, violating people's constitutional rights. Right. It, it certainly is, um, you know, contained in, in the documents that we got discussed in the report. You know, it's evidence of the realization of, of so many fears of people uh, in, involved in, um, you know, who are politically engaged. People who are engaged in, in the system uh, have feared, especially with NDAA, you know, that they might be labeled as terrorists or, you know, under the very broad language of NDAA, you know, and aiding against hostilities against the nation. And then, in fact, we did find a number of communications and uh, materials we obtained discussing uh, FBI uh, monitoring of um, NDAA protest groups, uh, Fusion Center, of course, in Arizona, uh, as well as the U.S. Capitol Police. And I, I did... And this I have is reason. thousands what? of people, thousands of police officers around the country in your city. Uh, you found that there were 70... Uh, anti-terrorist police officers in various communities in Arizona. So we can imagine oh, that's just every... Eight, 800. 800. <laughs> 800. So there's oh. thousands nationwide. So we're, we're just about out of time here. But uh, do you have a last word, uh, Bo? Uh, let's see here. How about a place you can direct people so they can go and read this amazing study? Yeah, yeah. Um, the... Um... The report can be found at the CMD websites, uh, SourceWatch and PRWatch. Mm -hmm. PRWatch.org. Uh, yeah. Right, and SourceWatch.org. And the uh, the source materials behind the uh, the report, the vast majority of them, or a large majority of them, are currently available on the website that I publish, dbapress.com. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Bo Hodai, for your work as an investigative journalist. We hope people check out your study, Dissent or Terror. Last-minute announcement, Thursday, June 20th at the California Theater here in Berkeley. We're going to be hosting a special show for Project Censored to KPFA. Jean-Philippe Tremblay will be here to show Shadows of Liberty. We'll have more on projectcensored.org website, so please go to that. You are tuned to 94.1 FM, KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 and online at kpfa.org. Up next, Democracy Now! This is a listing of upcoming events in the Bay Area for the week ending June 16th. All events are wheelchair accessible. Please listen closely for contact numbers. On Monday, June 10th, from 7 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., Cuban poet Nancy Mori John will share her published work at 2969 Mission Street between 25th and 26th Street in San Francisco. Doors open at 6.30 p.m. Donations accepted. For details, call 415-821-6545. On Thursday, June 13th, from 7.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m., there will be an evening of music, dance, and dramatic reversals of fortune all mixed up in a bingo extravaganza. This event takes place at 2513 Blanding Avenue, Alameda. For details, call 510-865-5060. On Friday, June 14th, from 6.30 p.m. to 9 p.m., a showing of the Latin film Sin País, or Without Country, 
explores one family's complex and emotional journey involving deportation. This event takes place at 48 South 7th Street in San Jose. For details, call 408-297-2299. The community calendar is produced by members of the First Voice Apprenticeship Program. Send your listing at least three weeks in advance to KPFA Box 51, 1929 Martin Luther King Jr. Way in Berkeley, California, 94704. Or email us at calendar at kpfa.org. Tell us if your event is wheelchair accessible. To hear this calendar again, call 510-848-6767, extension 621. This calendar is also online at kpfa.org.